your stories uh, have been heartbreaking, uh, but they have also been inspiring. Um, it has been a humble privilege to hear them. Um, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say we all wish you very well. The message from Judge Evangelos Thomas to the victims of the Fakadi White Island eruption, those who suffered horrific injuries and the whānau of those who died. We know their stories well, but for many, the court trial was the first time we heard from the victims themselves. Since losing him, it is always, it's always there. The morning that he left... He told me that he might have a feeling that something may happen. Uh, he, he went to work anyway. I know that's my son. I recognise his big puku. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, too many. That's too much. But sometimes they were too unbearable to tell. Standing beside them, speaking for them, giving them comfort, a hug, a hand on the shoulder, words of encouragement, was victim support worker Colleen Ellis. Here she is speaking for the father of tour guide Hayden Marshall Inman. Every morning when I wake up, I can see the White Island in the distance and wonder just where Hayden's body lies as he never came home thanks to the incompetence of those responsible for his recovery. And here she stands next to Beverly, the mother of Sydney man Chris Kozad, who died. I was told on Christmas... I can't read it. Please, do you want me to read it? You're doing well, you're doing I, I can't, All right. I just can't read it. Since the disaster, my mood has been low and I've been frequently tearful. I constantly feel empty, as if there is something missing. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. Today on The Detail, the crucial, often heartbreaking, sometimes dangerous role of victim support. In the 12 months to June 2023, this government-funded organisation helped 48,677 victims, a record. But their work is not just those few minutes captured of them in court. Sometimes they walk beside the victim for years. Today we meet Melissa Gordon. She's worked for victim support for over a decade on the front line and now in charge of the service to clients. So we're supporting victims of uh, crime, suicide and traumatic events. So some of the more extreme cases um, obviously would be things like homicide. So in a homicide we are involved right right at the get-go, so that could be at the scene, that could be alongside police, sort of supporting them as well as the client um, while they're getting informed that their loved one has, you know, unfortunately been killed. Uh, it can go for years right through that criminal justice process, which includes a coronial process, which, you know, obviously by the time you've gone through the criminal justice system and moved on to the coronial process, that could be a minimum of two years. It's not saying that we're speaking to the client every single day, sometimes not even every month, um, especially as that time goes on. But we are certainly involved when they need us or as the your criminal justice system is rolling out, really. So are you saying that you get a, a call very early on? Yes, so the majority of um, the referrals we receive are from police. Um, we're not part of police, but we are based mainly in police stations across the country. They would be one of our key partner agencies, stakeholders. We could get a call just after the incident has happened or... You know, we have other agencies that can refer, like within courts, there are court victim advisors, another key partner that we work alongside. So we might get called in yeah, at, at, as someone's going through the court process. The likes of Ficardi, so I know that we had a team of people on scene there and providing that at that point, obviously, it was a lot of support to um, witnesses and whānau of you know, people that were affected and that support did continue right up until what you saw in the media. So when you say victim support was on scene there, are you saying on the day that Fakari White Island erupted, 
victim support was there. Yeah, yep, we were there. Um, as soon as we get the, yeah, well, the referral, I guess, which obviously we're in the police station, so we are getting in a, in a major event like that where we're in the police stations anyway. So, um, yeah, often we'll go along with them. So we will visit people wherever they need us to be, pending safety, obviously, but it's not uncommon to be visiting people in hospital. Say, say in the case of a homicide, mm-hmm. you get called, what, very soon after the incident, round, round about the same time that the police are responding, victim support is getting that call to go and, as you say, support the police as well as the client. A lot of our support, especially in that crisis point, is really you're just being present. You're making sure that if it's not the person themselves, but maybe one of their um, whānau members or support, you know, part of their sort of support network that might be present with them, it's making sure that they understand what has just happened. You know, that's sort of part of this psychological first aid. St John do it. A lot of social services do psychological first aid. Um, you know, you've really got to think, if you're going to get a knock on your door and you've got a police officer standing there, a victim support person standing there, and they've just told you that something terrible like a homicide has happened to your son, to your daughter, you know, what is it that you're going to want to know? What has happened to my loved one? Where is my loved one? And what's going to happen next? But again, they're in a state of trauma. You know, they're in a huge state of shock. So it's making sure that that message is repeated as much as it's the person needs it to be repeated or it's passed on to a support person, a family member. Moving on from that, I guess it is, you know, providing information. So that could be the criminal justice system on grief in general. People say, you know, they feel like they're going crazy. So we play a role in actually saying, you know, it's actually really normal to feel the way you feel or think what you're thinking, have these experiences, whatever they might be. It's a normal reaction to an abnormal event. Mm. Um, Yeah, people are surprised how it affects you so physically, you know, that sort of level and degree of trauma. In what way, Melissa? I don't know. People do all sorts of different things. So um, some people can faint. Some people don't cry at all. Some people could collapse, some people can get angry, the heart rate goes up, cold, hot, silly bodily functions. Some people need to run to the toilet, some people vomit. And then on from that, people start to get concerned because they might be having flashbacks, which, of course, if you've never had that experience, that is going to be really troubling to you and it's affecting your sleep. You know, if you've been through a traumatic event, it's really normal to get flashbacks if you were still getting flashbacks, you know, a little bit further down the track and there there was a huge effect on your life, then, well, hey, you might be starting to look at reaching out for more professional help. That's when we would look to find who could meet that person's need within the community um, or maybe through different funding avenues. Who actually gets the support? I mean, you say the role has changed and it's kind of a much tougher role, but are there guidelines for who is actually eligible for this support? It is grey. <laughs> mm. But um, if you're a victim of crime, and people can define that in all sorts of interesting ways. But I guess we work in line with the Victims' Rights Act. If you were a victim of a crime under the Victims' Rights Act, then we would support you. That's not saying if if you were maybe slightly outside of that, we wouldn't. If you're a victim of suicide, so when I say victim, you know, if you're a witness, a whānau member, if you're a friend, a first on the scene of, well, really any traumatic event, then you're fitting into that criteria. So fatal motor vehicle accidents, assaults, kidnappings, homicide, suicide. So you have talked about the range of situations that you are called into. So if, as an example, if you're called out to a homicide very soon after it's happened, how do you actually prepare for that? I mean, you get the phone call and it could be the middle of the night. How how do you, as the victim support person, start to prepare for speaking to that person who's going to get the worst news ever? 
Yeah, it is definitely quite a surreal um, moment. You know, I always thought to myself personally, you know, if it was something that I started to get used to, then I would need to remove myself from the front line. But look, I guess for me and everyone is different. Um, So I really ground myself. So I do, you know, a little bit of breathing, a little bit of mindfulness sort of a technique. You know, I remind myself this moment is not about me at all. Ultimately, as terrible as it sounds there is nothing I can do to take the pain that this person is feeling or about to feel away from them so I really ground myself bring myself into check and then I yeah look I just I just be present and allow people to feel and do what it is they need to feel and do in that moment and hey look then then there is a little bit of a judgment call happening here because you know I'm always very mindful that you know, people are going to want to know where my loved one is. You know, they could actually still be at the scene um, or they could be in the hospital at a morgue. And there's lots of little processes and rights that go alongside those things. So you people do want to know that. So then they can make like an informed choice. Because reactions of people are unpredictable, have you had to sort of back away from any kind of difficult situations? I haven't had anybody ever lash out at me. I guess I have been on the, you know, peripheral of a scene where there might be some heated opposing gang exchanges. I mean, we do pretty intensive training, so we're pretty aware of those situations. I I wouldn't have been in that situation if police officers weren't there. What what is the most difficult situation that you've been in? I mean, you say that you're doing less frontline stuff at the moment, but when you were doing it, they all have you know all the situations that um, have their challenges. I think um, emotionally difficult for me, for whatever reason, probably because I have my own children. I was at a homicide where the undertakers they were just removing the body and um, the hearse was driving out and it stopped because the family were, you know, all on the street, as you can imagine. And one of the sons put his hand on the hearse and, um, you know, and sort of just lent his head on it and just cried. And that emotionally, out of all the things that I've experienced, that really emotionally hit me in the heart, Um, I guess, thinking of my own children. Yeah. What, what did you do? How, how did you bring comfort to him? Well, you know what? I actually, I just, I didn't do a thing. He, he, that's something he needed to do for himself. He was, when I say a child, he was an adult child. I didn't do a single thing except, um, you know, once his father had obviously been removed from the scene and emotions were calming down, I just checked in on him to just see how he was feeling. That's all you can do. Yeah, so sometimes it's knowing when to stand back and and allow that person just to express their feelings yeah. and when to kind of step up. You know, when, when we watched Colleen, your colleague, who was the victim support person at the Whakari White Island sentencing. Yes. She was very close to them, wasn't she? She was physically very close and occasionally she'd put out a a hand, touch them on the shoulder or sometimes hug, as well as at the same time talking to them and saying, you know, do you want me to take over or, you know, would you like me to say that? So you must become good at, you know, judging a situation. Yeah, I think you do. You do become good at it. But I mean, you have to try to read the situation and you're just not always going to get it right and owning it if you do get it wrong. The crisis point is would be the hardest point because you don't have an existing relationship. You know, so for Colleen, she had a long-standing existing relationship with all that Fano. I don't think that there is one single person that she was not involved with had, or hadn't been involved with for a long extended period of time. You know, she's got enough connection um, and knows those people well enough to know that a touch on the arm is reassuring that a hug is appropriate, that to ask, you know, do you want me to take over is is appropriate to say. Once you've got the relationship, 
and that connection and, and they have it with you, then then you can read each other, if that makes sense. Just mm. like just like any relationship, right? Yeah, and, and because of the justice system, because often cases take a long time to get through the system, you know, years, you would have had long term relationships with some people. Yeah, I mean I can think of one that I worked on and it would have been six, maybe even seven years ago now. And certainly the gap between the trials and sentencings and things like this that happened and then going through to the coronial process, that gap in the middle, I, you know, there wasn't a heap of communication between me and them. But as soon as that coronial process started to come to the forefront, you know, they're getting prepared for it, they're aware when it's going to happen, then they were contacting me. And that was a two, two and a half week um, coronial process and I still do hear from them today not randomly because there's always a need there there's always a need for them to contact me but it could even be that they want to understand um, you know when someone passes away so like some legalities around that which is not my forte might I add mm. however I knew who to send them to um, but if there's a specific need that they have they don't hesitate to ring as I think yeah okay I, I've done a reasonable job here because they've come back to me. How do you unwind from one of these intense situations? Like if you've been visiting Farno to break the news to them, how do you, as the victim support person, come home and um, deal with it yourself? Yeah, I hear what you're saying. And I think, <clears throat> again, everyone's very different in that. Um, if I was talking very high end, sort of stressful situation, I actually don't come home straight away, even if I just pull over to the side of the road, you know. And even if I don't feel that it's emotionally affected, I give myself the time to allow my adrenaline, because, you know, there's a level of stress involved in it, uh, my adrenaline to come down and allow myself to feel whatever I might feel you know, in that moment. But honestly, I often come home and I am just grateful to see my partner, to see my kids. I'm I'm grateful that I, that I have them to come home to. Um, for me, it's been like a life-changing experience and continues to be working in this space because it's changed me as a person. Like, I don't sweat the small stuff. I'm really quite chilled and laid back people would think I, that I should probably be more highly strung because you know I see firsthand how someone's life can be changed in a second so I don't worry about the small stuff I like I milk the small moments you know I like really suck in the feeling I feel when you know one of my daughters smiles at me that makes sense yeah has has the role of victim support changed? I mean, is it now dealing with much tougher situations? So it has changed. So historically, um, historically, you would see victim support. We were probably in more dangerous situations, if I'm honest, in the in the early days. You know, I mean, we've been around for nearly forty years now. Yeah, I, I would say we would have been in a lot more dangerous situations and we didn't have the you know technology that we have today um, or even our sort of national body that was looking over us all. It was all very individual. So, you know, I think we have a little bit of, of, of a hangover reputation of being cup of tea makers. Mm. <laughs> that's what I call it. Um, and hey, and I'm all about making a cup of tea. I'm like, if that's, if the person needs to, you to make a cup of tea, then by all means, make the cup of tea. But don't make it because you feel you need to do something. Um, the complexities of it has changed. Obviously, the level of violence around the country has, yeah, that has changed and increased. Has it? Well, yeah, I think it has. Mm. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not talking statistically here. No, just um, by your experience. Just, yeah, just from what I see. It's remembering I've been here for a wee while, like when uh, methamphetamine became a more prominent drug of choice, I guess. You know, you could definitely see the, the increase in violence, I guess. And the intense training, you talked about you, you do get good training for this situation. What is that? We're just doing a big review at the moment of all of our training, so it's only going to get better. 
So at the moment we do sort of four days. So it's a big ask, especially if you're talking about volunteering for us. But we do give four days of um, training. So one day of that is dedicated to supporting victims of suicide um, because, you know, that's a pretty heavy topic to cover. We're looking at these skills around listening skills and empathy. We're looking at, like, your unconscious biases, talking about the organisation generally, how we work alongside police, criminal justice system. You know, we're touching on all those topics. We're just starting to, um, you know, delve into more... You know, what we call reflective practice. So, you know, looking what we could have improved on or what went really well, you know, that type of thing. We link in with some national or local agencies. Um, Skylight is a good one. The Grief Centre is a great one. When you, if you're talking at a support worker level where you are on the front line, we generally, we buddy people up. You can only train so much before you've got to learn on the job and yeah. have that experience yeah there were a couple of things that you said to me yesterday which I thought were really interesting I think there was something about you have to learn to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation yeah yeah you've got to learn to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation so yeah I I get asked um well like for me an uncomfortable situation is sitting with someone that's just been told their child has died you know that's not a comfortable situation for any person to be in you know, when I talked about how I sort of prepare myself and I, you know, keep myself in check, that's how I prepare myself to be comfortable in that uncomfortable environment. You also have to remind yourself that, you know, I'm not going to fix anybody. Victim support, we're not offering a fix. We're offering to walk alongside a person. I had a mother say to me, she had lost her son, how am I going to go on without him? He was my favourite, she said, he's my Mm favourite. I remember having a giggle about that with her. And I said, I I don't know, because I don't know. I'm not going to lie. I said, look, I I don't know how you're going to do it, but but what I do know is that I've seen many people do it. You know, I've seen many people face this type of tragedy and carry on. And I'm not saying that it's not hard. I'm, personally, I think it's the hardest thing any human being is going to have to go through. But I can give her hope because I've watched people do it. And I can give her information, tips. I can recommend all sorts of things to help her along that journey of healing. But I ultimately, I can't heal her. That's it for today. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. The detail is supported by RNZ and NZ On Air. Gwen McClure produced this podcast and Jeremy Ansell engineered it. Thanks to Melissa Gordon. Kakite.